Welcome to Common Unity, the podcast that unveils the unique life stories shaping the individuals of today. Often, you know, it's scary, right, when you're going to start a business, and I've had a few people be like, how do you just, like, take the leap? When you play to your strengths, you experience ease, excellence, and enjoyment. Yeah, right time, right place, but you put yourself in that place. Huh. Like that, that luck yeah. never happened without all the work that led to you being in that place at that time. Who cares how people look at them? Whatever keeps you ticking, you know, until you get yeah. to the next thing and, and figure it out. Join us as we unravel the triumphs, challenges, and pivotal moments that have crafted the past of our guests. I'm Jason Fox. And I'm Nick for now. Let's get into the show. When you get a good balance, your body hums and functions at a really high level and you can keep going day in, day out. And then we use a range of different support networks and that's the other side of it. I want that to be world class. A little bit different only because I think the mindset approach that I'm that I'm trying to bring in here, it's not that that's a, wow, oh my God, he's come up with something new. I get that it's not that new. You incorporate with everything, and my focus is not to be have an impact on someone over a short term and they gain it all their hard work they do. I want them to to really benefit from that. So it's a long term solution with a sustainable model that's looking at a lifestyle change, not just a quick fad diet. And on that, guys, it's also super important to us that this gets out to more people. So if you can and you got some value from it, please share it on your social media tag your friends in it, send it to someone that you think may get some value from it. So that if we can get on good guests and ask them great questions, then hopefully everyone that's listening gets some value out of it and we can keep bringing on better guests with the experiences that you need help. Okay, welcome to Common Unity. Uh, Today we've got Alan Cook here with Inferno Blast and he's got some inspirational yarns about health and fitness and different ways we can approach it. So welcome Alan. Thank you. Thanks for uh, coming here. over. You've come over from Rotorua, is it? Sure have. A little hour trick. Jeez. Hey. We're getting important. We've had a guy from Auckland now in Rotorua. We, this is a real <laughs> deal, this podcast. <laughs> Travelling for it. <laughs> driving, get, when they drive to us, yeah. Keep it in the bay, you know. <laughs> keep it in the bay. <laughs> yeah. So where does, your, where does your journey start? Like, Obviously, you, Nick's mentioned Inferno Blast, but there's probably been a couple of things that led to this business. So where did... Where did your journey start? Uh, it goes pretty deep. So I come from a big family, uh, six of us little siblings, and I'm the I'm the baby. And my father was a bit of an athlete, so he um, was a pretty high level rugby player. Played for Wellington, and he was an athlete in athletics. And so from a really young age, my parents talked to me about um, nutrition. My mother was very um, uh, headstrong about healthy food so basically from a child she always talked to me about healthy food yeah. so I, it started that young and my father wanted me to become an all black so between m- both parents um, all through my childhood they were talking about um, uh, peaking as an athlete and what it took and so my father would make me special drinks in the morning and I had that all the way from my childhood and then, good yeah <laughs> it was pretty cool so that's how it started and then when I turned 15 one of my oldest sister said, I think you'd really like doing um, a degree in exercise science and nutrition at Otago. And I agreed with her at 15. And so literally from the age of 15, I was focused on a career in exercise science and I made it um, that that way. And I'm now 44, so I've spent all this time from 15 oh, um, building a career. And I became a teacher out of that as well, so I taught it. I was a head of faculty and also a dean and I've always been focused on high performance and a big part of that to me is nutrition. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the long long story of it. Nice. Yeah, if, you, if you're listening to this, uh, the guy doesn't look like he's eating too many pies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never skips leg day either. <laughs> oh, I know, the veins are intimidating me. <laughs> <laughs> So having done it from like 15 to 45, it must have evolved a lot over that time. Like, because I'd know that, you know, you're meant to eat this and then now you're not allowed to eat this. And then, you know, this thing's really good for you, but now you've got to do it this way. Like, has things evolved or has it stayed pretty for you? Definitely. So how I've approached it is a lot of people say a lot of stuff around the world. There's a lot of people coming out making statements, as you guys are probably aware. There's fads all the time in this industry. It's a billion, multi-billion dollar industry. My philosophy is I trial everything on myself first before I promote it with all of my clients, 
that's locally in New Zealand as well as other countries around the world. Um, and so I have worked for nutrition companies and, like I said, I've taught a range of different, um, I suppose, philosophies, looked into everything that's been around. And so mine's a, a compilation of, of multiple different um, approaches that I believe work because I think we're so multifaceted as a human being and we're so unique with how our bodies function, you have to come at it from multiple angles. So my Inferno Blast structure that I developed over about three or four years, but obviously I spent maybe 15 to 20 years um, fine-tuning yeah. beliefs that I had, um, it's really a combination of a lot of things. To be honest with you, so yeah, it's definitely changed over time. But obviously, our human bodies haven't changed that much. What has changed significantly is the way our food's produced, um, the quality of our food, and I, I truly believe that um, our the best type of food that we have, which is raw vegetables and fruit, is decreasing in nutrients. And there's enough research out there to um, back what I'm what I'm saying. And so I'm moving towards a model that uses supplementation as a as, a, as an aid to increase um, our body's function at a peak um, level in order to feel the best we can and obviously get our health up to a level that um, we all should enjoy. So you're not sucking on raw liver every morning to get your nutrients yet? No, no, sir, my friend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds uh, very yummy, no. Because <laughs> that's yeah. the problem with the carnivore diet, right? Everyone's like, I'm just going to eat steak and the weight's going to come off. It's like, yeah, but where are your nutrients? So. Like, if you're going to do carnivore and eat liver, then you're probably going to get your nutrient. But if you're not, then you're going to have to take a stack of pills, aren't you? Yeah, well, the thing is um, there's multiple ways. Look, if, if we just look at something simple like fat loss, there's multiple ways to, to achieve that. So you can do a carnivore diet and strip away some fat. Are you going to feel as good as you could? I don't believe that. I personally don't believe that. I think we need a balance of micronutrients which is your fruits and vegetables basically you know and obviously bring it break it down to minerals and vitamins and your macronutrients so proteins fats and carbs and i think when you get a good balance your body hums and functions at a really high level and you can keep going day in day out yeah so basically i've had a few significant things happen with my health that have really aided in what i've what i've built yeah so one of those things was I was chasing a professional rugby career here in New Zealand and I got pretty close, but I never got the contract, which is why uh, you don't know who I am in the All Blacks. <laughs> um, but I got pretty close and and I for about two years I was chasing getting a good 12-pack, lots of abs, because yeah. I was tra I knew I was training enough and I, I couldn't understand it. And I was looking at my food and I thought, oh, it's pretty good, it's pretty good. And then I did one thing, which is I cut out my carbs and and. Within two to three weeks, I became a keto fan to a to a degree because because I think everything needs critical thinking. So um, I believe when we have a decent amount of carbs, there's an insulin spike. The body reacts in a certain way, which blocks any fat loss and kind of prevents us accessing that energy source. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way I describe it to people is: look, if we're eating good levels of energy that are accessible to the body. Why would we need fat, which is there as a safety mechanism for the body? You know, we have fat on our body, so if we can't eat and, you know, we get sick, we use that to survive. Yeah. yeah. And I believe that the heart of fat, that's why it's sitting there. Obviously, if we have an excess, the body uses it and our brain goes, oh, no, we could use that one day. Let's not waste it. Let's save it for when we need it. Yeah. So... If you're going to eat some carbs, the body goes, oh, no, there's our energy source. Let's save the fat in the body, if you kind of get what I mean, and it reads it really well. Because yeah. um, another way to look at the body is there's so many chemical reactions happening constantly all day, every day, and working with the brain. So there's chemical reactions, chemical reactions, and our brain um, unconsciously redirects everything in the way that it needs to, and that's also interlinked with our thoughts, which um, we're going to get into soon. But... Um, <laughs> I just, I genuinely believed within the two to three weeks, the only difference in what I was doing yeah. was cut out carbs. So from that moment on, I've always been a big believer in controlling the macronutrients. Yeah. And if we control the macronutrients, then what we can then do is take the pressure off our portion control, weighing our food, and also focusing heavily on a calorie deficit. So the, globally, everyone's talking about a calorie deficit, and I'm not saying you don't, you know, you shouldn't. 
But I also think there's a level of that it's not a sustainable lifestyle change. It's too focused on numbers. It's not realistic over a long period of time for people to always weigh their food, to always look at their numbers. It's what I describe as it's draining on and and tiresome on the brain to stay that disciplined and focused over a long period of time. We need a what I describe as a mental release of not always saying no or not being so disciplined and focused on something that isn't that enjoyable, if you understand what I mean. So weighing our food and counting calories is good for a short period of time. We can all do that, and we learn a lot in terms of portion control. But if we have to do that over a year, two years or longer, humans get to a point often where they just get tired of holding this discipline line, if you guys can understand what I mean. And so I want to take that away, and I believe – the model we have in Inferno Blast takes the pressure off the brain constantly. Yeah. There's less pressure. It's simple. It's easy. Um, as opposed to a, a, a true keto diet, you are heavily focused on the numbers. You cannot yeah. go past a certain point of carbs that you ingest. You've got to massively increase your fats, which I personally don't agree with the level of fats and the type of fats that they're eating. Yeah. And then obviously there's a there's a protein um, high high protein source which I believe we should all do for the rest of our lives. Yeah. So yeah. And so if I don't understand, uh, just the so controlling your macronutrients yep. helps takes the load off your brain and helps you control your portion. How does it do that? So basically, if we have a high protein diet, yeah, and we supplement that with a high vegetable diet, and obviously you can. You can be quite relaxed with fats, but I just don't believe that's all types of fats. So you're quite limited with good fats, in my opinion. Avocado is an example. Everyone knows avocado is a pretty good fat. Um, Even something like a fish sauce like salmon has good levels of fat. Then we look at oils like olive or coconut oil. Then where do we go from there when we're talking about fats? What are we talking about? Bacon? (laughs) I I question that. (laughs) Uh, Butter? Yeah. and cream so the reason why people like keto is the flavor that comes with keto right. yeah. they get excited about cream butter bacon as an example and don't get me wrong when i'm out and about and i'm i'm being social and i go to a cafe my first question is do you have anything keto because that keeps me in line with maintaining good levels of fat in my body yep. but if I want to be at my peak and my healthiest, I'm not going to have a lot of bacon, I'm not going to have a lot of cream, and I'm not going to have a lot of butter. So, like I said, bringing it back to fat, there's not a whole range of good fats, in my opinion. Yep. So you can't afford to focus on that. What's, so, what's wrong with butter? Sorry, I just eat way too much butter, and I thought it was good. Because <laughs> I thought it was... I was like, ah, oh, it's, you know... It's yummy. It's just um, a, a simple way to look at it. It's quite, it's quite processed. So yep. it's what goes into it. It's not. It's not really aiding us in a good. It's. It's not a beneficial type of food. Yep. So look, look at it a little more like it's a processed type of thing, yep. as opposed to like an apple, where you know there's all this nutrients that come with comes with and fiber. Mm-hmm. It's enhancing the body in the way it functions. Yep. Butters, I believe, butter's main sort of thing is its taste. So it yep. makes things taste nice. Yep. Well, it's still got to be better than seed oil, though. Yeah, right. definitely. If, you, yeah. if you're cooking in canola oil, cooking butter, it's going to taste better and it's going to be better for you. Yeah, so... Coconut, obviously, better again. It, that's right. So how I'd rank it is olive first and then coconut. Or well, either one of those are pretty similar because they're very natural and it's a really good fat source as well. It's a higher quality fat source. Butter would be number three and the rest are very far behind. Yeah. So they make them sound really good. You know, avocado oil, grape oil, peanut oil, mm. they're really not that good. Well, canola, canola oil. oil was designed to run engines on, and then yeah. it's, and now we put it in our bodies. Like, fuck, come on, bro. Oh, are those chips good? That you, yeah, yeah, yeah. What were they boiled in? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> they, it tastes it tastes really good, but when we're looking at getting the body to function at a really high level, yeah. you've really got to be selective. So bringing it back to the question, if we increase our proteins to quite high levels, and they're good proteins, so obviously we're talking about things like fish with that minus the batter and the crumb. Um, uh, steak or or lamb for, in terms of red meat, keeping in mind that it's high in cholesterol. And then the other one is, um, it's eluding me right now, fish. Chicken. Chicken without the skin. Um, so I think those three, I call them clean meats. Mm-hmm. 
And then when we start looking at everything else, there's, there's a lot of research now talking about um, processed meats um, being quite detrimental to our health. Um, so like mints. Yep, mints, yep. Uh, salami, sausage, um, surimi. What is surimi, people? Just quietly, I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, pass. <I> pass. <laughs> yeah. Hard pass. That's like chicken uh, nuggets. So, like, yeah. what's, what are they what really? They're, they're about 10% 10, 10 <laughs> chicken, and what's the rest of it? Yeah. yeah. So if you if you control that side of things, and obviously pro anything protein is high in amino acids. Amino acids are building blocks for the body, so it's all about repair and growth. Um, with vegetables, you can get away with a high portion size and minimal calories, but also minimal impact on the body because it's the body processes it so well. So I don't know if you notice whenever you have a salad, you're hungry relatively quickly after that because it's low in a, a term we call satiety, which means how hungry you are and how long you are satisfied for after you have different types of food. Yep. So, e.g., if you have a boiled egg, you're going to be fuller for longer as opposed to if you had a fried egg because obviously it evaporates some of the water, it's lighter, it's fluffier, and there's an impact within yep. your gut, I suppose. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I um, thought about that, but yeah, you should have brought right. a notepad. <laughs> <laughs> if only we were recording this. If only we were recording <laughs> this. <laughs> um, so it's that simple. So obviously, by restructuring the way we eat, yep. which goes against some of the science that's out there, because you know they talk about these percentage splits between carbohydrates, proteins, and that. That's good when you look at it not from a fat loss point of view, though. So it might be good holistically if you're in what I call a maintenance phase. But generally, I'd say 70% of the population are not looking for a maintenance phase because they're not happy with where their health's at. Yeah. We basically have an obesity epidemic across the Western civilization uh, or Western countries where our populations are gaining in size and weight right across the board. I think America is one of the worst in, on the planet at the moment. And this has been consistently coming through statistically for the last 15 to 20 years. And I don't see it getting any better myself. Mm -hmm. And then we reflect on other cultures around the world where they don't have it, and there's some clear differences in terms of the ways they're eating, and the, and a lot of it is to do with clean eating. You know, it's clean, raw food. It's cooked really well. There's not a lot of processed foods. So at the heart of what I'm talking about is is that is if we bring it back to simplify it, keep it in the basics. It doesn't need to be a complicated system, mm -hmm. and it all starts with controlling the level of carbs that we have, if we just to look at those three simple macronutrients, foods of proteins, carbs, and fats. Yeah. The flip side to that is when we talk about carbs, you incorporate anything to do with sugar. We call that a carb. And the next part to that is anything processed. Generally, it's, it's made in such a poor way with all the additives and everything else they put with it that it has such a negative effect on the body. Mm. So that needs to be cut out as well in what I would describe as the first phase of um, stripping away fat and really trying to make a transformational change with your body. Oh. So obviously, I'm, like I said, I'm, this is day 75 for yep. seventy five hard for me. <clears throat> and the first two weeks, we cut out carbs. Obviously, we cut out sugar, bread, all the stuff you pretty much talked about. Yep. But I think on about day five, I woke up in like sweats in the middle of the night. I felt beads of water like sweat running down my chest, and I think that was just coming off the sugar. And I didn't even think I had that much sugar in my diet. Obviously, I'd, I'd have a few beers and stuff like that, but that was the hardest thing. I had headaches for two or three days, and I just had this big detox, and then after that we came out the other side and no cravings or anything pretty much after that day. I was just like, oh, cool, this is a breeze now. So I would basically call that a detox. So, yeah, yeah you, in my opinion, you 100% went through a period where your body went into – semi shock that it was not getting something it was used to getting mm. consistently regularly and that brings me back to what I was saying before we really don't know what they're putting in a lot of the processed foods and a, there's a high percentage of um, health, uh, food scientists that are incorporating sugar as an additive for things that I don't believe need sugar yeah. but the science is saying our brains are liking it that much if you get to a certain percentage point of a volume then they will make a lot more sales based on what the chemical reactions of the brain is with the sugar content of bread and um, if you get a bun at McDonald's or something like that. And sugar on the back of a label isn't just written sugar, is it? It's like... like uh, cane, corn syrup is a syrup real and, common yeah. one, and that's a monetary thing because obviously they, they can spread corn syrup across a massive volume and get the same impact. Um, compared to some of the raw materials, which it's way more cost, you know, costs a lot more money. Yeah. So that's the other 
side to this whole thing there's a massive yeah. money making industry at the detriment of human beings health and it it actually makes me quite motivated to be on the other side of the ledger saying hey look there's there's a lot of uneducated people about food and nutrition and i've spent a large part of my life going the other way and i feel like that's one of my purposes on this planet is to share my knowledge like we yeah. are today and the hope that some of it settles in so people can be more educated about their choices they make and feel more empowered and like i said before we want to get away from this this notion of um the brain stress that we have we're trying to hold the line of being disciplined with food because our brain tells us how much we love it you know my one of my favorites food is cheesecake oh. and that tracks back to my childhood my mum would <laughs> once a year make a homemade cheesecake and she'd spend two days getting it ready and it was beautiful so that for my whole life has been my favourite dessert is a cheesecake. Yeah. Huge fan myself. Yeah, yeah. I love yeah. cheesecake. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like on a cheesecake though, guys. We're yeah, talking, yeah, you know, yeah. there's a big difference these days. Cheesecake factory. Well, yeah, it's the one that I New cheesecake. I'll or? tell you, stop it. I'll be like, <laughs> yeah. <old> chocolate, vanilla <laughs> swirl, <laughs> cheesecake it. factory. Oh. <laughs> Couple of fun first desserts after this. I'll, yeah. I'll just watch because I've got one more day till yeah. I'm <laughs> <laughs> four hours. But yeah, midnight. Are they open at midnight? We'll just say it Yeah. So Inferno Blast, lots of ways to attack it. We've kind of touched on uh, like food intake. Yeah. And then there's obviously other facets to what you do. There's training. There's um, mindset. What, what do you want to tackle next? Or training side of things, the mindset side of things. Um, so basically um, what I've designed is a, is a, is a three-pillar um, system with Inferno yeah. Blast. So there's the nutrition side of things and the general idea is what I just explained to you. We, we keep it really simple for people. We don't give a lot of room for um, foods that tempt them too much. So it's quite prescribed um, and it's, it's a very successful model. There's underlying themes I've used in there. I researched um, the American Health Association. What they recommended was the lowest level of calories for men and women. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to come above that to make sure that um, we weren't going to come under any criticism if we were trying to go too low, if you understand what I yeah. mean. And it's quite um, detrimental to people's health when they starve themselves, which is one of the most efficient ways to obviously lose fat. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah like know. a three-day water fast and stuff that people do. Like, oh, man, yeah. look, at, look what I lost. It's like, yeah, you didn't eat for three days. And, it, and, it, and again, it's hugely not sustainable, and that's where my passion is here is a lot of things work on this planet. A lot of them work. Yeah. Mm. But not many of them are actually sustainable. And I'd, I'd be interested to see if with you guys with this um, 75 hard, is it? Yeah, yeah. How sustainable that is. So my theory is it might not be that sustainable. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to come across critical here. I'm just saying a lot of people can, do, can dedicate to a certain amount of time and they can do it well. They can yeah. hang in there, but they're literally hanging in there to the end and then – it's like there's oh, this. Oh, yeah, let's creep back in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It so starts with day one. You go out and you have one beer, and then, like I said, we go to America, and then this, we might drink five days a week or six days a drink, and then you come back and you've got the habits that have just been 75 days breaking. Yeah. So they all creep back in over three weeks again. So it's, yeah, it's, it's staying strong for that sort of thing. I'm yeah. On the opposite to him, by the way. I, I'm yep. on the slow burn. Like uh, from my wedding, I was probably at 103 three years ago. And then now I weighed myself this morning. I was 88, um, and I just I'm all about just making small incremental changes that you can do consistently enough till it becomes a habit. And then now I just find myself eating better food, doing more exercise, riding my bike as often as I can because it's fun. Mm. And then I've got an ice bath and a bunch of stuff. I'm over a year deep of an average of every day. I cut off two days at Christmas, but other than that, every single day for the last year in the ice bath. And so just things that I can try and uphold. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I do, I do agree with that slow burn approach because then it kind of sticks with you over a long period of time. Because mm. I was on the full, like I would do uh, three months stint at the gym, go hard as, be stoked as with the results. And then over two years, of, and I would stop going to the gym for nearly two years sometimes. Mm. And then I, it would come a point where I felt awkward taking my shirt off, and then I'd do a three-month stint, <laughs> and then it just kind of went on that cycle. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And that's been similar for me, but it's always been like three months, injure myself, bad habits creep in, finally get good, go back to the gym for three months. It's been like three on, three off, three on, three off for years. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, well, I think it's quite, like I said, it's quite common. So what we're trying to do with Inferno Blast, we're trying to build a lifestyle. We're trying to build something sustainable, which is the focus from day one. But I'll be honest with you, it's really hard to get to the end place in the beginning. So I look at it as in terms of phases. So we have our first phase, which is all about building belief. So one of the strongest things is the mind saying within yourself that you can stick with something, do it for a long period of time. And what we tend to do is we give ourselves an outlet. Oh, no, I just need to make it to here, e.g. the end of a challenge. You know, I can do this for eight weeks. Cool, well, what happens at the end of the eight weeks? What are you going to do then? So it's having the right mindset to believe that you've built something that will stand the test of time, but you can't do that in day one to ten. And day one to ten is, oh, does this even work? There's doubt. There's so much doubt. Oh, my friend kind of got me to do it. Oh, I'll, I'll give it my best. But there's a, our brains work in quite a unique way. You know, we say one thing, but there's a deep belief that's actually quite contrasting to that, and we want to get to that belief, and that takes time. And a lot of that, we're not even aware of some of these things. We're, we're almost unconsciously saying another message. I always give up. I hardly ever see anything to the end. Um, I've tried so many things. I've always failed. These are deep-rooted beliefs that a lot of people have when they're looking at their own health. And it takes time to change that because so for some people, that's 10 years of the same message. 10 years of a yo-yo diet, if you guys understand what I mean. So with Inferno Blast, the second pillar is around exercise, and I try and keep it really simple. So we have what, we, what I call a non-negotiable, just like 75 hard. Every single day, um, our Inferno Blast members need to do 30 minutes of movement, and I've kept it really simple because mentally I want them to believe that they can get it done. And Now, if I say 30 minutes of 75% intensity on a bike – there's all these other things that creep in for them. It's too hard. I don't have a bike. Uh, you know, so on holiday, I don't, all, yeah. all that sort of stuff. So I, I've tried as hard as I can to minimize all these creeping excuses, all these reasons. And they're all valid reasons. And I've just said, no, no, it's non-negotiable. I don't want to hear the reason why you can't do it. If you're bought into this program, you need to get you need to get it done every single day, and it makes you start to really believe in yourself and that that core element of i can do this becomes something tangible and real that they can see every day and i i think simplicity is is underrated as humans so when you keep something simple and they don't have to think about it they just have to get it done for overthinkers on this planet and people that you know need to know all this detail there's no detail in there you know just get it done and i i believe by doing that sort of thing on something simple like a walk for someone that's injured or they're you know they're 75 years old they can still walk and so it's just get it done and the third and final one is the mindset part and that is what builds into a sustainable lifestyle model because i truly believe my food plans are as good as world class as anybody else around the planet same with my exercise plans i haven't come up with anything what i would say new and groundbreaking you know me saying 30 minutes of movement i'm not going to set the world on fire with that you know <laughs> Um, but what I do believe is going to happen is is the three pillars incorporated together over a period of time will start to show people that we have something here that is a bit of a contrast to a lot of other models out there. We have, I've really tried to think about a year down the track, eight months down the track. Um, I've tried to steer clear of end dates, and the mind is what's going to get you there. It's not going to be how good the food plan is because we tend to get bored of something over a period of time. And what is sustainable, I think, is saying to people, look, you can have your cake and eat it too further down the, crack, uh, further down the track. Right now, you can't have your cake because you, you haven't learned the discipline it takes to not have it too often. And I believe at the heart of a sustainable model is winning what I call the frequency battle with the foods that we love. So I'm, I'm still going to continue to have cheesecake for the rest of my life, but how often I'm going to have that is the key to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. So if I have cheesecake in April, I make a pact with myself the next time roughly I'm going to have it again. It's not going to be within April, May. So I might have a one in June. And then another way, if I want to increase my frequency of that, I make another pact with myself. And I got, I got this from the, the all-black trainer. He says he has a block of chocolate a week, yeah. and he offsets that with two bike rides that he does. True yeah. story. So um, Nick Gill, I think his name is. Okay. And um, and so he has an agreement with himself, so he burns it off. Yeah. 
And, and so there's different ways we can get there to a, what I call a sustainable model. But if the mind is not saying the right stuff, then you're going to revert back to these deep-rooted old habits. And we've got to really train the brain to say the right stuff when it comes to our health because it's, it's a high level of self-love when we get on top of our health. That's a big thing that I've found during this challenge as well is actually I believe the thing that I've found probably that's made me so successful in completing it is I changed my identity. Because my identity, if you go back to podcast one of Common Unity and Jason Fox, was, you know, I built my career on being the guy that someone would have a beer with on a Friday. Mm-hmm. I'd get offered jobs all the time because I was a fun going kind of guy that was always available. So I was always, I've always been available. Someone's like, hey, bro, what are you up to tonight? I was like, yeah, actually, that sounds like a great idea. But recently it's been like, no, I, I'm not. My identity is I'm getting fit, I'm doing this, you know, I want, I want to be able to run around with my grandkids in 10 years' time. I've changed my whole identity. I'm looking at those beers and not even tempting me, even though I know I'm going to be able to have them tomorrow. I don't know that I will. Mm. And it's just the identity's changed. I think you get that right, like you're saying that's the mindset. You change how you see yourself, how you perceive yourself, and it actually becomes quite easy. I agree, and I think that, I think there's really power in finishing things, mm. and we don't actually show enough respect for finishing things. You know, um, the feel-good feedback factor we give to ourselves when we complete something is quite high. Mm. Um, I'll give you an example. I entered in my first 12-week challenge a few years ago. And while I was on that 12-week challenge, I travelled around Europe and went to 12 different countries, or whatever it was, and I, I, didn't miss, I never missed a day. I was really proud of myself. I was in Dublin and I was in the gym and you name it. I was everywhere and I was training. I never missed a day. And, and to prove to myself that I could travel around Europe and still stick to my 12-week challenge, I, d- I don't know a lot of people that would have been that disciplined mm. on a big OE around Europe Still, you know, I got a membership in London when I first arrived because that was kind of my base, if you get what I mean. Yeah, yeah off back, and, yep. and and I got to the end of that, and it's like you remind yourself you can do these things, mm. and we can be really brutal in ourselves and our, our minds, and it's something we don't often talk about. So I don't know if you guys can relate to what I'm saying, but you know, there's yeah. a lot of people walking sure. around. And they're saying some pretty um, critical things of themselves that never get aired and it never gets corrected. Mm. And I and we're really trying to work on that. So we, we talk about I'm feeding the brain every day with positive messages. I'm a big fan of podcasts like this, of anything on Audible, um, yeah. what you read. Um, if we're constantly feeding the brain positivity, yeah. you know, I, we give ourselves a chance to continue to see things the right way and have and we control our perspective. So we, we're very detached sometimes of how our mind is functioning, like it's other people's responsibility. But I think when we start to really shift into this realm of how do I want to think, what sort of what do I want to achieve, what are my intentions, where do I want to go, and who's responsible for how I see things and my behaviour, then we really start to take more ownership. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, well, I've been preaching it for years, and Nick would have heard it. It's like, you are what you eat, right? You eat KFC and everything we just talked about, you're going to be fat. Well, it's the same with your mind. You, you go home and watch Channel 1 News every single night, you're going to get depressed because the world's a scary place. But mm-hmm. like you said, listen to the podcast, feed your mind with positive stuff. That's how you show up in the day. Yeah. One thing that I've found is uh, when I went travelling, I was doing like, I did you know six months here, six months there, a few years back, and um, if I made the exercise or the things that I wanted to do fun, like if I had to... I made it a challenge. We're on this big road trip, ten cars, and all the all the other people were older people, and I would carry all their bags to their rooms as like a game. That's my workout for the day. And then I was practicing handstands at that point, walk, walking on my hands. And so I had to walk from my uh, wherever my door was. I had to try and walk on my hands. It's like because that actually gets sore in the shoulders and a bit of a workout to the stairwell. And I would not be allowed to use a lift on any place we stayed at. I'd have to hit the stairs. And then, you know, you get down to the ground floor and forgot your glasses or something. You're like, oh, and you just stick to the challenge. But as long as you like the handstand part is what made it fun for me. Mm. Because like it was just, I get out my door and I'm kind of excited to see how far I can get to the stairwell. It's like just before I did that. And so if I made it a fun challenge, then I was excited to do it every day. And it made it easy to get in enough repetitions to kind of maintain my physique while I wasn't going to any gyms. Mm. Um, and then, you know, just became a fun game to play in my mind to then, you know, what else can you do? And then I learned how to do handstand walking, which I couldn't do before I left travelling. Mm. Yeah. 
I mean, people can do it. That's pretty rare. It's, yeah. it's tough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I think the other thing that's important to talk about is um, kindness on ourselves. So it's really hard to be perfect 24-7, 365 days of the year. What we do when we make a mistake or go through a period of, of tough, uh, challenging time is really important, how we respond to that. So I have a phrase that I use often, which is every day I reset and I go again. So um, it, it's, it cuts us getting momentum in the wrong direction. So tomorrow you guys could have lots of beers, have some cheesecake, that's the famous word to today, um, <laughs> maybe have some fries, whatever, you know. It doesn't mean it's all over for you. So what some people do is they give themselves an excuse to give up. Oh, man, I had a bad day, I had a bad week, oh, I've got no momentum, I've lost all my gains. Yeah. No, no, no. When you decide to quit and revert back to that old life, how does that look? I'm a big fan of The Matrix. He's seen that movie and they, yeah. they, he's about to hop out of the car and she says to him, you know how that road is, you know how that looks, yeah. Yeah, if you get what I mean. And it's quite a powerful thing to think about. When you get off a health kick, where, what's the alternative to that? Mm. The alternative is you're going to gain weight again, yeah. you're going to go backwards and just think about how crap you're going to feel in five months' time all because you get frustrated with your lack of discipline execution. Whereas if you have it every day, I reset and I go again, you can have one bad day, you start again the next day. The sun comes up, it's like a new day. So I actually, I'm really encouraging people to look at things in a 24-hour snapshot. Win one day, focus mm. on one day, and then roll those days together. And there's certain things we need to do every day. Every day we need to move. Every day we need to get out there and do something. I believe that. Mm. And we feel way, our mental health and everything else, there's so many side effects from that. Every day we need to try and stay on top of our food, but it's a it's a more consecutive thing over the day. There's longer, sorry, there's more frequent periods of eating than there is exercise. You know, my model, I encourage, and I have different models that I work off, but one is boosting the metabolism. So a key part of that is eating frequently spaced out over the whole day. So if you have breakfast at 7, you might not eat again until 10, 1, 4, 7, as an example. That allows your metabolism to stay operating at a really high level. If we have big gaps in the day and we have a five-hour gap, our metabolism slows right down. It doesn't burn at the same rate. So that become means become less efficient at obviously burning any calories or fat off our body or maintaining a good, healthy body. If we have a high furnace, then what that does provide a high level of energy. And not, not a lot of people are talking about energy on our planet at the moment, I believe. When we have high levels of energy, we're more motivated to get more active. But normally that's a sign that we've got a good balance of things like hormones in our body, micronutrients, our body functions at a level and we feel amazing and that's what we're aiming for. Mm. And it's that model that's very different for a lot of these um, these diets and stuff. They have little effect on energy. If anything, the energy drops. And I know for me, if I go for a period of time during the day where I don't eat, yeah. my energy just drops. I can feel it dropping my focus goes, I'm lethargic, and I go, wait, when's the last time I ate? Oh, that's right, I haven't eaten for five hours. Yeah. So if we maintain high levels of energy throughout the whole day, we're a better human being. We function at a higher level, we're more productive, we're happier, and more importantly, we have the energy to move. Mm. And that's one of the big contrasts between a lot of these fad diets and, like I said, people that drop their calories to a ridiculous mm. level or... Mm. They fast for half a day and they wonder why they're not very good in the middle portion of the day or things like that. So, yeah. Well, I had a, just before coming here, um, a bit of a lull. Like, I've got a two week old child and I've not obviously been getting that much sleep. Uh, and yep. um, before coming here, I was feeling a bit tired. And then the autopod thing that I'm going to use to be editing this later has been glitching out. And I spent an hour and it was really frustrating. And then I was like, no, nah, I need to get a whole bunch of energy for this podcast. So I just jumped in my ice bath for four minutes and then did a little bit of breathing while I was in there and then hopped on my bike and biked here knowing that when I pump my muscles, it actually gives you energy and some pumps me with endorphins and I just feel amazing. I feel 10 out of 10 compared to like, and it wasn't, it wasn't food that did it, it was the ice bath and the exercise. And, and so I've now connected exercise with energy, not burning energy, it's giving me energy. Mm. And so if I feel a lull, I grab my dumbbells and do some bicep curls or some squats and it actually gives you energy it's crazy totally agree there's research out there so a good way to think of your muscles and your body <coughs> is it's like car batteries 
So when you go out and you use the car, it recharges, and we have the same sort of cell structure happening in our bodies. I believe that. Yep. So I, t- I 100% agree with what you're saying. Plus the circulation thing with the cold water, that's yep. obviously a slightly different um, system, but very effective. And one of the most efficient ways to actually lose fat is through yeah. cold water immersion. So Yeah, that cold shock protein, eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I learned about this thing called the hope molecule that your muscles produce that goes up into your brain that reduces stress and makes you more optimistic from yep. burn- just moving your muscles. Um, and so I just loop that until it's just in the forefront of my mind. And then, uh, and and it just motivates me to go and like if I feel tired, I go and do something to give me energy, yeah. rather than um, sitting on the couch and thinking I'm tired. <laughs> I think we also um, <clears throat> we're quite proud of ourselves when we work through those those periods where it's not easy. Yeah. We get a bigger payback for that. When everything's humming and you go out for a run, you don't you don't feel the same as the day where you don't want to do it, but you still do it. Yeah, there's a bigger there's a bigger payback, and it lifts your own self esteem and your own self confidence within yourself. Because um, Jordan Peterson talks about you don't get away with anything, and I, I kind of believe that too. Because the thing is, you can you can have this outward appearance, to everybody else, you can say all the right things, but you know the truth inside, and the truth yeah. is what you know you've done. And what you haven't done, and so you don't get away with it. So mm. you can have an outward smile, but inside you know, oh man, I, I really didn't do anything for the last three days, but no one's seen me. So how would they know? And you know, yeah. so I can keep this front on and stuff like that. But so that's, um, that, that slowly eats away at you, like over time. That's what I mean. Yeah. You, so then, you don't get away with it. You know what yeah. I mean? So even though no one, no one witnesses that you've done nothing, you know the truth, and that's more damaging than anything else. I, I believe anyway. Yeah. So. Well, Mosey was talking the same stuff on a podcast I was listening to today as well. It, they're talking about, you know, you walk past the bin and you throw some rubbish in and you kind of miss it and keep walking and you're like, oh, fuck. Go back, put it, pick it up and put it in the bin. No one would have even known who left it there, but you know. Yeah. yeah. It's you that left, you littered. My two year old's got that. It's bloody funny. My <laughs> wife went to put something in the bin, it blew out. It was a windy day, went under a car and she couldn't get to it. She's just given birth, had the other baby. And the whole way home, my two-year-old's crying. And then I get home and I'm like, what's his problem? And he look, he's like, mommy didn't put it in the bin. <laughs> so it's, it's eating him up big time. He's worried, he's worried about the dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like that evolves into an adult and it still eats you up over time. And so you have to know within yourself that you've done it. And that, that's the thing with this, this challenge as well. The 75 hard Andy Frazella talks about. He's like, people that have completed the challenge know people that say they've completed the challenge. You know, mm. because you are different at the end of it. If you've done the two workouts, you've you know you you've drunk your water, you've got every single photo. Mm. You can tell the person who's actually showing up and done that versus the person that oh, I skipped a couple of days, but you know I still completed the challenge. Yeah, no, you didn't. Mm. No, you miss you miss a photo, you're out. Yeah, you know. and I found at the start of the journey, like I was, if you did like one or two, like first ice bath, you're like taking heaps of photos and all that sort of stuff and you're like yo did an ice bath and then after you've been doing it every day you just don't even like most days majority of the time you're just hissing the ice bath by yourself in silence no one ever knows i still but, get a few photos oh, of you he's pulling the fingers at it <laughs> yeah snapchat snapchat's good yeah. snapchat's good yeah. yeah but yeah the the 0.5 degree ones when you accidentally leave it on too long they suck because mm. you get in there anyway and then you know takes probably 20 minutes afterwards to get the good feeling <laughs> it's not instant. <laughs> it like, sucks for half yeah, hour. it sucks for <laughs> a that's while. the growth again that's yeah. where you're growing yeah, well sure. yeah there's nothing that hard and and then i find when i do breathing sessions and stuff if i do a breathing session after an ice bath i can hold my breath like 30 percent longer because my body's just used to being tough and just sitting in it because you want to get out of the ice bath the whole time pretty much yeah and then you mentally make yourself stay in there and then you go to do these breath set sessions and then your breath hold just extends like 30% just naturally because your brain's already conditioned itself to tolerate hard stuff. Mm. And then that gives me more motivation to go out and do things. Like, oh, I'm tolerating way more today. I can be more patient. I can do all these other things because I know I've exercised that ability to just endure hard things. Yeah. Yeah. And it's compounding, as I've noticed. I suppose there's also something to be aware of is people are coming in to anything like mm. Inferno Blast or 75 Hard with their own um, prior baggage. Mm. So you can come, you can get a, like I said, world class food plan, world class exercise plan, 
and here, and it's tailor made for you. But if you're coming in with poor gut health, your digestion is not working very well. The issue isn't with the food plan. The issue is actually prior to you coming in. There's no fat loss happening, even though the food plan is good. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So the food, my food plans are designed to be high in fiber, for example, and enhance gut health. But they're not always a solution to an unhealthy gut. Do you get what I mean? Yep. So there's these other factors that are that need to be addressed on the side, which is where support comes in. So you can give them a great food plan, you can give them a great um, exercise plan, but if the support is not world class, then people fall through the cracks. Yep. So one of those is to do with stress. When we are stressed, we breathe shallow breathe. Deep breathing, which is what kind of, I'm assuming that's one of the factors of what you're talking about, provides a higher percentage of al- uh, alcohol, uh, oxygen to the body, Oxygen is like gold to us if we get enough oxygen. Mm. The issue is when we are stressed, we shallow breathe, we deprive the body of one of the most important things, which is quality oxygen and enough oxygen. Just like water, I'd say 80% of people working around this planet are dehydrated. They don't drink enough water. Water is huge for the, the, the peak performance of a body. we like 75% fluid is what our bodies are. Mm. So it makes sense to have high levels of, of water. <laughs> Then you look at sleep. So if we don't sleep, if we don't get enough sleep, again, all these things stop us from functioning at a level where we can shed the fat. It, the body, when it's not well, it holds on to it because like I explained at the start of the podcast, mm. fat is like an emergency safety mechanism in the body. So people look at it fat like it's really bad, um, but it's a survival mechanism. So when we're not good, the body holds on to it. And that's that stress, that sleep, digestion, and anything to do with the gut health, those three are pretty massive when it comes to you can have everything that should be working even even with a calorie deficit and it's still not moving because the body also plateaus and it does it's really clever the body will adjust based on the level of calories that you consume so you think you're going to have the same amount of fat loss no it doesn't work that way it, it slows everything down to match so if you drop your calories the body drops with it which is how the body does the plateauing which you guys might or not, might not have heard of so um, there's those factors, that, yeah. environmental factors, you know, in the house, if the house is really negative and everyone around you is constantly in KFC and McDonald's, that's not a long-term thing that's going to work very well. You need more supportive people around you, mm. as an example. And so those other things need to be um, addressed if initially these things aren't happening, if you understand what I mean. And so hey, for someone that's listening, if they are planning on getting a world-class diet and a world-class training plan, how, what's some indicators that they could have that maybe their gut health isn't that good before going and spending all the money on these world-class things? Because obviously you'd probably get your gut health right first, would you? Um, you don't You don't have to. It's more like an awareness. So how regular are you, for example? You know, we're getting into delving into this topic. But how regular, <laughs> how yeah. regular are you going to the toilet? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, what, yeah. And what's the quality of the stools? Sorry to bring it down to that level, but, you know, there's key indicators. That's a quality that's, and not quality. <laughs> like, are we? Are you you ask is there I, like would, I wouldn't go with the smell just because protein diets <laughs> tend to be pretty horrendous for two things. Normally, the size uh, okay. <laughs> and the smell can, <laughs> can get pretty interesting. But um, no, it's to do with things like color right. and 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 the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Floating as well. With yeah, the floating. Um, so the what's shape. Good and what's bad? Well, you just want it, you know, it should come. You want <laughs> Sorry, to, I'm just, it, it, you, just you want it to be a one piece, not squirting yeah. out. And yeah. Yeah. If it's floating, then you've got some fibre in your diet. That's good. Yeah. Okay. It, can, it comes out quite smooth. I don't know any of these It comes out quite smooth. If you got to know why poop, <laughs> you're good. <laughs> yeah. so good. Yeah. So, and, and, it's, and you should be in a bit of a rhythm with your body. So, yeah. um, everybody's different. So, some people might go to the toilet twice a day. Yeah. And obviously, we're talking about defecating or sorry yeah. people that to take it that level but um it's it's quite a big factor when we're talking about fat loss yeah. and it's something that's not talked about a lot yeah. and that and, and one of the key reasons why some people could have an issue with it is because their dairy consumption as an example yes. or their gluten um and there's other health issues that people don't even know they have and then all of a sudden they do a plan where they know they're sticking to it and they're saying something's not right something's not working and so I go through the checklist with them. We start looking at different things. Mm. Because I've already covered the bases with a lot of these things. I've done it for them so they don't have to worry about it. Yeah. They don't need to think about it. I've already gone through and double-checked all the calories with the plan so they don't need to worry about it. You know, I've done the numbers yeah. um, as well as controlled the macronutrients, stuff like that. So it's all done prior to that. 
So when they come to me and say it's not working, my first question is how closely to the plan are you sticking? And when they say I'm, I'm not, I haven't veered from that, then we start looking outside of yep. the normal things. So it's not that I want people prior to coming in and doing a detox, which that would be useful. Yeah. The plan in itself is a detox anyway. Okay. I mean. So yeah. So, so it'll write itself over time. It's just not going to happen as quickly. Yeah, that's right. That's so the, cool. the, you know, it can happen quite rapidly when everything is. And like I've said a few times, peak performance, the body will will really surprise you. Mm. But we're all different body shapes and types. So, you know, for me, um, well, you guys can tell, but you can see the veins. I'm probably sitting around 6% body fat at the moment. I, I'm a bodybuilder as well. I compete. Um, so I want to get pretty lean to show off the muscles, but that's not everybody. Um, so I don't need to focus on fat loss at all, really. But I still need to pay attention to how my body's functioning and I want to function at a decent level so I can continue to perform at a pretty high level. Yeah. And the other thing I do is I, I do a lot of fighting. So I've got a one-on-one -on -one fight coach and I'm getting ready to get in the ring, just boxing, hopefully at the end of the year. Um, the problem is I'm very aware that getting knocks to the head is not a good thing for us. So yeah. um, <laughs> I have a... Um, Working on your defence. A lot of the defence. <laughs> <laughs> um but for me, it's a bit of a that's a bit of a spiritual journey. That's yeah. that's actually a lot less about hurting somebody else, and it's more about knowing that I can protect the ones that I love and the worst case scenarios, which unfortunately is part of our life. The yin and yang, you don't you know you don't know how good you have it until you see the other side of things. So um, yeah, anyway. So was there something that drove you into wanting to do a fight, or was it just kind of personal journey? Like he's, um, he's a white boy living in Rotorua. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have had a couple of times downtown. I won't lie, but um, I've got two daughters. I, I'm I'm pretty traditional and old school. I, I take my role within a partnership um, quite seriously. Protection, I think, um, as a as a as a man, um, I've had home intruders in the past, and I expect to be the one. I want to sort that out. If you get yeah. what I mean, I want my children to be protected in the room while my partner while I defend if that makes any sense so I'm not trying to sound old school but I just believe that's yeah. my role yeah, yeah. I would not want my partner to be going outside sorting out a home intruder yeah. or you hide behind the bed well uh, yeah you know, um, <laughs> how's it going yeah <laughs> you got it uh, yet? <laughs> yeah and you know I started playing rugby again. from when I was five so that's quite an aggressive you know it's a physical contact sport yeah um so it's an extension of that sort of stuff as well yeah. and but um, I'm, by no means do I want to go around hurting people. That's not what drives me. I'm all about um, actually uh, I want to make a big difference on people's lives across the planet with what I think is my gift, what are my purpose here, which is, which is um, educating people on how to get on top of their own health through a range of different approaches. And um, I believe the key is really through a mental angle alongside obviously good quality um, exercise and food plans. Yeah. So how does that actually work with your program? Because we talked about obviously it's diet and then it's a workout and stuff. Is it a, is it a weekly coaching call with you? Is it a online subscription? And like what, for the people listening, if they're wanting to sign up with you, how does it, how does it work when they come on us? Yeah, so um, so we have a subscription where they, they sign in um, and they become a part of a community. So... Um, I, I'm a part of that equation, so um, I've designed all the plans. The plans will be sent out to them based on their um, demographics of their body, you know, um, what they weigh, their height, um, their, even their experience in terms of the exercise, stuff like that, any in issues with allergies, um, injuries. So they're tailor-made to each individual each time? Uh, to a degree. Um, because I want to go global and I'm aware of that... Um, the ability to go electronic and automated, I have designed something that's generalised, but obviously I'm hands-on when it needs to be more tailor-made. So if that makes it's like a hybrid. Yeah, yeah. So they might get an initial one that's based on their demographics, so it's not as tailor-made. Mm -hmm. But then any tweaking, obviously I'll step in and there will there, there's always an element of, um, I'm very hands-on, I, I love what I do. It's not really a job for me. I've been doing this a really long time and I get yeah. excited with helping anybody and everybody. Yeah. And even talking about this today, I'm excited about this is what I want to do. Yeah. So um, hopefully that comes across. I'm very passionate about it, but in a good way. You know, um, I've had such a range of different clients. I feel very confident with my ability to get to the bottom of a really tough um, individual where things aren't working. 
and I think there used to be a TV program with a doctor, I can't remember what it was called, but he, the, it was like a drama series and they had these really unique um, symptoms and he was this really clever doctor that had to figure out what, what was going on? I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. It was on uh, TV about two or three years ago. Okay. Oh, was that when they go on that little bus in the back and uh, they'd come to him with... Oh, like, was that one as well? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like really weird things going on. Um, he had like a walking stick and he was, you know, he was a really, really clever guy, but um, they had all these real curveballs, so really yeah. tough, you know, and we're human beings, so we're all quite unique. And I believe it's the same sort of thing when we're looking at even fat loss. One size doesn't fit all and... Someone has something wrong with them, they don't even know. You know if there's a thyroid issue, depending on what it is, if it's hyperthyroid, then it works w for them because it burns a lot, their metabolism is quite high, so the danger of hyper is that they're going to lose too much weight and kind of like get too skinny. Yeah, that's the same time. yeah, but if it's hypo, that slows everything down and they're very likely to be overweight and, and it's really hard to lose weight. So knowing the difference and then being able to spot the difference prior to them getting diagnosed... Um, makes a big difference when they're trying to lose, you know, lose that weight and not yep. and not actually had it, you know, um, sorted through a doctor. And you've got a lot of people walking around like that. You know, they've got really low levels of energy. There's something wrong, but they don't have a solution. And I like to think that I could back myself to really steer them in the right direction. I need a blood test to find that out, though, won't they? Yeah, I'm not, definitely test. not going to try and claim that I'm. I'm not trying to replace any, um, you know, medical practitioners. That we, you know, we definitely not don't try and do more than what we um, say we can do. But I think you um, point them in the direction. Go, hey, you might want to go and get a blood test for this. Yeah, get there a lot quicker, and then obviously it's all about getting results. So uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a cool thing to offer people, and you know. Um, at the end of the day, like I was saying before, I've got about 6% body fat. So me losing 500 grams of fat is, re is really high based on my body. Another guy sitting here is 140 kgs, 500 grams for me, you know, if it's week one or week two, um, something might not be right there. He should be dropping maybe a kg, maybe two. But for me to expect to drop two kgs in the same period is not realistic. Yep. I'm a lot leaner, a lot less fat. And so my our bodies are in different places it's incredible how much fat you do carry because when i started this challenge i was like if i get down to 93 kgs i'm gonna be fucking stoked like now i'm 88 kgs i'm like geez i could look like i could lose another five <laughs> <laughs> well it's, fun it's funny you say that because i talk to guys often about their abs yeah. um and i talk to them a little bit as a motivating factor because they come to me wanting that i talk to them a little bit of a percentage so if they get to a certain percentage and then we can correlate that to obviously kgs as well, yeah. then the top half of the abs will start to show. Yeah. And then if they want to reveal more of their torso, then obviously they've got to get leaner in order for the bottom half to show. Then if you put in the external obliques or the ones on the side, they need to they need to either get a little bit leaner or start to do more twisting action, you know, Russian twist, for example, to help um, make muscle the muscles up. pop. Um so you'll be surprised how much muscle we have in our bodies if we are able to reveal that, yeah, which yeah. is hiding under a layer of fat. Mm. So that's normally there. The abs are mm. normally one of the ones that are sitting there waiting because it's like a stabilising muscle and a posture yeah. muscle, so we use it quite often. But when we sit down, we tend to use it way less, which is one of the reasons why I believe a lot of people are putting on weight in the middle and not in, other, in the extremities because they move. we move our arms and legs a lot but if you think about what happens with our torso every day, for a lot of the bulk of the day, if we if we sit down and we're sedentary, that's the one area that hardly moves all day. Yep. And to me, that's the reason why we have accumulation of fat in the area. If you look at it from a comparison to other segments of the body. Or sit ups. Yeah. <laughs> I used to have a theory that I don't know if it worked or not, but because I used to carry a bit of body belly fat. Because I do rollouts every single day, and I was like, if my abs just get big enough, it'll like push kind of ab-looking things through the fat. Yeah. <laughs> and it seemed to work a little bit. But yeah. now I'm just much leaner. So it works. But yeah. So yeah. What, where do you think abs start showing? So what percentage? 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 Yep, somewhere around there. About yeah. 16, 15, I think the top stop starts to show for, for most guys. And then obviously you get down... As, you, as it comes down, you get lower, more comes out. And obviously, working them helps the definition of the abs as well. Yeah. So that's always helps to give it more of a, a peak or a shape. Because what you want is the indentation as well mm. to really show them off. 
if you get what I mean. But you don't get that if you don't work the area. But you'll still have them there. It just won't be as pronounced yeah, yeah. as if you worked it and you stripped away fat. Well, it's the same with the arms, isn't it? If you yeah. want to get bigger arms, you've got to work it out. It's yeah, yeah. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> what, would the go-to, what would be the go-to ab exercise uh, for someone who doesn't have any like exercise equipment at home? Is it... It's obviously not sit-ups, or is it? I, well, I break it into three parts. So, obviously, external oblique. So, I'm a big fan of Russian twists. And what's a Russian twist? A Russian twist is where you normally hold, like, a kettlebell or something, and you rotate. Right. I talk to people about making sure they rotate the shoulder in front of the chin. And right. That's the maximum, what I call, range of motion. And then if we turn and do the other shoulder, you can kind of see even me sitting here. I just have to make sure I place the kettlebell behind my... Um, bum and then I get that full rotation and that's as much as I can possibly do through this area yeah. the, but there's a couple of other things I can do to enhance a Russian twist so I can I can elevate my um, feet off the ground and now I'm working the lower abs and the V taper and I then I can the third thing I can do is lean back and now I'm getting the upper half so I'm actually hitting right across the torso yeah. whereas the bulk of people just kind of just do that and if you don't have a kettlebell we're talking pot plants or Anything that has a, yeah, no, good, I like the way you're thinking, um, two litre thing of milk, yeah, or, yeah. you know, it's a decent, you, you know, know. It's, and, and you just increase the reps, so you can get more out of it if it's too light, yep. you've got to do what you've got to do at home, yep. so normally I always supply home workouts with my gym workouts, yep. um, and I think, again, it's about getting it done, sometimes it's more important that you're still moving, as yep. opposed to the highest quality workout you can do, well, you can normally make up for that over a period of time, if you get what I mean, yeah, yeah. so I would rather do a 15 minute short burst of a run then just saying oh i don't have enough time i'm not going to do anything i think it's mm. it's not the right approach get something done keep going with your your lifestyle forming habits that's more powerful in my opinion yeah. than worrying about every day having this amazing quality workout i think that's the wrong approach it's too um yeah my at my last house i used to try and make it real convenient i had got a pull-up bar hanging from the roof of the shed and then anytime I needed to get anything out of the shed cost me whatever I can do max reps on the way in grab the thing and then I got to do max reps again on the way out I love that and uh and then so anything I had to get from the shed I just grab the pull-up bar and I'll just do one set yeah. of and it made such a difference like the amount of pull-ups you could do after like six months of just randomly doing it every time you got something out of the shed it was like I don't know my pull-up reps that I could do tripled that's cool in that time so, I used that was to just do, making it convenient. Oh yeah, I used to do that watching TV. Like if I'd watch um, sports, mm. uh, tricep dips off the couch, press ups. <laughs> uh, you know, if the other team scored, if I was watching with yeah. my mates, you know, we we made it a fun thing. Yeah, and it also took the emphasis off drinking, which is obviously not as positive. Um, and it's kind of fun, you know. And it's just this whole oh, I'm getting something extra in that I wouldn't normally do. Yeah. You know, if you watch a game, what is it, two hours of yeah. your life yeah. normally. Busting out a few press ups isn't a big deal, you know. You might get in fifty or sixty in a game. Will that mean something to the body? You know that that's the other the flip side is that everything counts. Yeah, everything counts. Yeah, we did two hundred push ups a day, and I, I think I went eight months without skipping a day. Two hundred push ups, and it was incredible. Just how again it was the blood pumping thing. Yeah. You know, I'd be sitting there at the desk tired, and we had a group. There's about eight of us, and like ding ding. So Adam's done fifty push ups. You're like, fuck, he's getting ahead of me. So you're yeah. like competing. And I'll drop and do fifty push-ups at the at, beside my desk, and then I'll, all this energy hits you again, and you're just carrying on like it was awesome. I think it makes you feel vibrant and alive, which I think yeah. um, we don't talk enough about that sort of stuff. You know, and your body moves well. Yeah, like it feels good to move. Mm. The other way to look at it is, is you look at what happens to the deterioration of of a leg when you break your leg. You got it in the cast, you hardly move it. You come out of the cast, and it looks like skin and bones. Yeah. It's, it's know, well, the contrast is um is crazy. And all you've done is you've hardly moved that thing. Yeah, six six weeks and you've got no muscle left. Yeah, yeah. And um, we work so hard, you know, to to build any muscle. It doesn't come easy mm. because we have a cycle with our muscles where we're tearing the fibres and we're actually breaking it down and then we're building it back up and it, it builds back bigger and stronger. But also I feel like we're not fueling our muscles efficiently enough, which is why it's quite rare to come across really big, Bodybuilders, you know, mm. that and they probably, uh, you know, getting um, extra help <laughs> <laughs> what they're doing. But, um, you know, a big chunk of it is water as well. You know, there's a high correlation with water and muscle growth and we just don't drink enough. Yeah. And so 
we we can deplete the muscle when we're working out, which a lot of people don't think about that. You know, you, you can use that as energy, and our body will do that if yeah. it, wherever it needs the energy source, it will take it from there. Because I was listening to some Gary Brecker stuff. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he was saying how you can liquefy muscle in like two minutes. Like uh, he was saying that if your body needs to you and you're fasted, you can use muscle as fuel in like. Is that does we use muscle as, as fuel like that? Fat. As opposed uh, to fat, if you're yeah, not I don't. I don't know in terms of. Um, I do keep up with a lot of research, though I haven't heard the the terminology that you're saying in terms yeah. of the speed. Oh, yeah. But it, um, ba- I agree what he's saying essentially, which is if you haven't fueled the body correctly with outside sources of energy, yeah. it will access it from where it wants to. Yeah. And yes, it's quite efficient at taking it from the muscle. So yeah. I, I believe he's probably right with what he's saying. I just don't know the numbers. I haven't looked at yeah, yeah, which yeah. is more the uh, the marathon runner versus the sprinter, isn't it? Like the marathon run, runners, a skinny little run versus the sprinters, this athletic man. That you, you burn cardio for too long, you start eating away your muscle rather than your fat. Is that sort of where that comes in, or is that because I've burned so much fat that it just starts taking from the muscle as well? Yeah, so the they tend not to consume enough. You know, in terms of the marathon runners, um, they're training, they're doing lots of Ks. They've got to, they've actually got to eat quite a lot in order to prevent muscle depletion. Mm. But um, if you're running really far, you probably don't want to be that heavy either. They're trying to stay <laughs> yeah. quite light. You know, it's just efficient to be light. So they would be, I would assume, the need. To, you know, if I was coaching a marathon runner, would be monitoring the weight, making sure they're not. Um, once they get to what I would consider a peak weight for them as a runner. We don't want to keep dropping weight, so they'd have to consume X amount. Mm. Whereas with the sprinter, um, obviously, the fast twitch fibers, power, it's explosive. We're talking 10 seconds and it's all over. Mm. Um, they can substitute a little bit extra weight because they need that pa- the explosive power. And those guys aren't that heavy, but um, you know they definitely not, look nothing like a marathon runner. They're pretty yeah, much... Yeah, yeah. You know, I've got a quick a point. question. Um, if you... Like, cause I I used to I didn't know anything about power and and strength I didn't know there was a difference um, when I was younger and I used to be a winger and then started training at the gym doing three sets of twelve just because that's just what you did three sets of twelve of everything yeah <laughs> and and then went pretty quickly into lock uh, <laughs> from wing <laughs> and didn't realize it was because of the training that I was doing and so if you wanted to go the opposite way what kind of training would you do to try and speed up the muscle. So I'm a because I used to be a winger and a fullback as well. Oh, Loved yeah, it. Yeah. Loved scoring tries. Never passed the ball. I should have been playing rugby league. To be fair, no. <laughs> um, you go. you've got to. If you don't use it, you lose it. So yeah. my theory with what you've just said is you weren't sprinting enough. Yeah. Um, and you probably got taller. Did you grow as well? So they looked at your height and thought, "Oh, we'll chuck them in there." I don't, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I did actually have a growth spurt as well. Otherwise, well, a lot too. <laughs> fucking. But I put, on, I put on like yeah. I went to the gym like a lot in a, in fit form, and yeah. then put on probably like twelve kilos in fit form so as well I, as height. Oh yeah. So I would say um, in terms of speed work, and obviously there's acceleration in there. Yeah, you've got to look at. Work in your fast twitch fibers as often as you can within reason. You want to be super explosive. The type of trainings you're constantly doing, you know, plyometric training, um, bounding and jumping. They've, they've done some research on cheetahs, the fastest land animal. I think they get up to nearly 100 kilometers an hour or something. Mm. They've broken the frames down. They reckon the cheetah's almost jumping. It's like a jumping motion with his gait or his, you know, Because they can sprinting. only do it for about bloody 10 seconds or something. On top yeah, speed, yeah. They blow out real quick. So it's, you know, so when I say jumping, I just mean they've um, they've put it down to the action of how he's hitting the ground with his feet and going again. It's He's on... Rather than striding. Yeah, like, rather than striding like, like a horse, you know. Yeah. You know, there's... Um, anyway, so you've got to keep doing that and you've got to... It's power to rate ratio. Yep. So obviously the type of training needs to be explosive. So me as a bodybuilder, I don't need to do a whole lot of power training. Um, hypertrophy is based on longer, slower movements. Time on tension, we talk about. Um, that would be too slow for a sprinter. So yeah. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna lose something if I continue to operate on it at a slow level. Yeah. E.g., if I'm a sprinter and I'm jogging everywhere, well, I'm training the body to go at a jogging speed. Yes. As opposed to an explosive power speed. So, yeah. 
I would say you need to continue to try and explode. Plus, um, you know, we incorporate weight training in there as well. So it sounds like you did everything the opposite to what you... um, Well, I went went through a phase like a couple of years back where every time it rained, we live right on the beachfront. I do sprint training down on the beach um, and just sprint full. As soon as my dog would walk up into the dunes, I'd then run full tilt until the dog would catch me. And then next time we ran up into the dunes, I'd run full tilt. And I did that for like a couple of months. And I don't feel like I got that much faster. And I was like, maybe I need to do something specific. So that's why I had the question for you. Because oh, yeah. I was really trying to, both my brothers are faster than me. And I was like, if I train every day, <laughs> I will get way better. And I kind of didn't get too much faster. But maybe if I was sprinting with someone and I could measure how fast I was going and how hard I was trying, then maybe I'd get a bit quicker. Oh, but yeah. It would have it helped. I mean, yeah. there's lots of different Just things do way you longer. do. Yeah, progressive overload sounds like you might not have had enough... Um resistance in there yeah. as well if you get what I mean like um, running downhills works at your top end so it makes you go faster so your your body gets used to moving quicker than it can push if that makes any oh, sense yeah. so that's one way to help your go. your top end speed that's the finishing <laughs> running uphill would help you your acceleration your start so mm-hmm. often you know with family sprint outs it's normally won or lost in the first 10 metres right <laughs> 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 and I'll, I'll give you an example I raced my brother who's 10 years older than me when I was 12 and he was 22 and to this day he still claims he's the fastest in our family which <laughs> I know it shouldn't grind my gears but he will. Ne- he's never allowed me to have a rematch yeah, yeah, <laughs> he's got uh, a trophy and yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, lost yeah. that within the first 5 minutes because I first was pretty cocky meters. and I thought I had my whole family because I've was. i been a sprinter a long time and so I just came out the blocks really slow and then when I realised he was actually really quick I, I didn't catch him in time, and I, I've never let it down. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so those go. two types of things, even your stride length, so, so um, shortening your stride length helps your acceleration at the beginning of a race as you're yeah. building into it, and then you lengthen your stride. I don't know if you guys have heard this, but this is yeah. one of the, the the things you work on with speed work training. Amazing. And general, not to sound too critical, but I don't think here in New Zealand we're on top of our game when it comes to speed work compared to other countries around the world, yeah. like America. Um, Jamaica, obviously, they the same can, They continue to produce some of the fastest guys in the world every single year, um, and I know part of that's genetics. Yeah, I was going to say genetically, that African American, yep. other so darker skin, have fast switch glutes. fibers, all that sort of glutes. You know, there's these aspects that um, they're they're all part of it, but also I think there's very high level coaches across yeah. the board, and that's what I'm talking to here. I feel like there's a lack of of knowledge yeah. here, and I'm not trying to knock people that do know what they're talking about here in New Zealand. I think our female athlete at the moment, she's sprinting amazingly yeah, awesome. well. Yeah. Outstanding. Oh, yeah. yes. um, and that's quite rare for us. I think Donaldson, he's based out of Dunedin. I think his father's that director. He was amazing quite a few years ago. You guys know him. He made it to the semi-finals, the Olympics. Now the guys get the attention quicker. Yeah, hey, there you go. <laughs> the strong uh, boots. Beats <laughs> <away. Strong laughs> <boots. laughs> amazing spikers. <laughs> yeah, so anyway. Yeah, nice. That's just the question that I had. Oh, so well, downhill, I'm going to find a school with a field that's got a slight incline, and I'm going to pace it out. Either way, <laughs> either way, I think the start. Yeah, that's just when your head's fast and your feet, you end up in trouble. <laughs> that's yeah. when you'll take a bit of weight up there. So take yeah. a roll. <laughs> <laughs> just lean into it. And if whenever Pay it's a win. family race, you got to t- you got to time it right. You know, when you notice your brother's putting on a little bit of weight, guys, it's time for a uh, race. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There we go. After what Christmas be? lunch, when you've only had one plate, there you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just wait to pounce. Yeah, you know, okay, it's all okay. strategic. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> lots of little 10, one, five, ten percenters. Yeah, add hey, them all up. It all counts. Yep, and make sure the start. You know, just go for that start. Just be the two short steps. Well, they're all, well, they're all joking around. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, there's no one joking around. In <laughs> family <laughs> sprint, bro. That is serious. And my brother's girlfriend's in there. She's a winger. Oh she's, yeah. So it's, it's the three boys and my brother's partner, mm. fiance now. So yeah. it's, it's it's very serious. It's not, yeah, it's I hear. No, yeah, yeah. We had we had one down at the mount over here. Uh, a I couple, lose every time. Couple Christmases ago. So yeah, well, I loved it. Loved yeah. It. So where to next for your company? Uh, have you you already got international clients? You've you've got goals for it, obviously. Uh, yep. So I'm I'm quite I'm very determined. I want to get into the American market, um, United Kingdom. Canada, basically start with the English speaking countries first, just because of the extra hassle of translation and, and, and changing, yeah, <laughs> changing everything over. Um, but 
that stems back. I see myself as an entrepreneur, um, and I've owned other companies and businesses, and I feel I got a really large chunk of a percentage of the market in New Zealand with one of my previous companies, and and I felt like I was on top of my game from a marketing point of view um, in terms of dominating the competition, and yet I wasn't satisfied in terms of um, feeling confident that we were doing that well. But the population here in New Zealand and the amount of people that was looking for my product, um, it, it, there wasn't an issue with, with what we were doing. It, the issue came that there wasn't enough people in this country as a population base. Um, so what drives me is I believe I'm capable of bringing this to more people. It doesn't matter if you're a New Zealander or an American, our human bodies, uh, you know, apart from slight cultural variations, genetics, um, the way they perform is very, very similar. So um, the idea is to launch into America um, and we need to make sure we cover our bases in terms of simple things like insurance. Um, it's a bit of a Sioux culture over there. Yeah. One mistake can cost you $10 million if you're not careful. You know, obviously that's the worst case scenario, but I, I like to think about those sorts of things when you're going into outside markets. Mm. We don't have that here in New Zealand. I think ACC is one thing that's a little bit of a deterrent. Um, they don't have anything like that in America, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it's always about refining. I, I still – something you brought up with me tonight, I'm going to look into that now. I'm interested to see what they're saying about muscle deterioration and how quickly it happens and what causes it. Mm. Um, so that just makes me refine what I'm doing. Um, but I do this every day, so um, – I'm also a personal training nutritionist, so I have about 10 to 12 clients um, five days a week, um, and I love that. So that's a hands-on thing. Yeah. Inferno Blast is designed to be um, electronic, you know, reach multiple countries. Um, it's not so much face-to-face. -face, it's more set them up with a system, yeah. and then we use a range of different support networks and that's the other side of it. I want that to be world class. Mm -hmm. There's only one of me, so I'm not scalable. Um, but I want to be able to step in if need be, as well as continue to, to refine this and make this something that's super efficient. So it's all about quality for me. And I think um, if we continue to get quality, then the people will come. Yeah. It's still quite early, early days. But um, if my confidence is not coming across, I really feel like we've got something to offer here mm -hmm. um, that's a little bit unique. A um, little bit different, only because I think the mindset approach that I'm that I'm trying to bring in here. It's not that that's a wow. Oh my god, he's come up with something new. I get that it's not that new, but you incorporate with everything, <coughs> and and who I am, which is unique. Then there's this blend of Kiwi thing going on that we 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 have down here, which is quite unique. I think we come at it things from a different angle. The way we promote things is a little bit different. So. I'd like to think that within a year's time we would have reached a decent uh, number of people with what we're offering. And like you said, there's a community, right? So, yep. you know, common unity, community. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> it's people want to belong to something and when they're on that journey, having other people to bounce stuff off of and, and be there on that same journey with them means a lot to them because it's easy enough to download an app and just look at a workout program, go to the gym, and be confused at how how you apply that to your life. But when you got other people on that same path with you, yeah. Well, I think um, the support is key. You know, getting good support separates you from a lot of the competition, in my opinion. And obviously, approaching it from a mindset thing are the two unique aspects, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, because, like you said, you can get a food plan from anywhere. So, same with an exercise plan, or you can just start doing things that are quite efficient when you use simplicity um, but if you hit a snag or something's happening and you've got no one around you to help well that that's a real problem and and my focus is not to be have an impact on someone over a short term and they gain it all their hard work they do I want them to to really benefit from that so it's a long-term solution with a sustainable model that's looking at a lifestyle change not just a quick fad diet we don't even like using the word diet, really. Um, thinking long term, you know, and we will endeavour to support as long as someone keeps coming to me with an Inferno Blast, we will always be available for them. There's no, there's no cutting anyone out. Once they join, they're in for life. And I like to think they feel that. 
and there's nothing better than feeling like you've literally changed someone's life, which I've, I do get that comment to me on a regular basis. Um, it, it's a significant change. And for when I was a teenager, I used to say, I really want to be a person that makes a difference in people's lives. And when I die, um, I want to feel like I've made a contribution that means something to people. Mm. And I'll be missed when I'm gone, but I leave a legacy of something that I've spent my life trying to dedicate, like we all try and do in our own little ways. And I just think that's what we're meant to be doing. And if we continue to progress towards that goal, we feel a lot better. So we, I may never get to a million people, but if I if I only help one person, I do that really well. That's enough too, if you get what I mean. And so it doesn't have to be a complicated equation. But I still, just like everybody else, I want to be successful. For me, it's all about options, providing for my family. I like nice cars. I want to own a, car, a nice car one day, supercar, I don't know, Lamborghini, Hurricane or something, I don't know. I'm all about um, feeling okay about having abundance. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with going for that those sorts of things mm. and having the opportunity to be generous with that as well. But if you never go for that, then I feel like you're doing yourself a disservice and you've got to try these things and I'm all about that, so yeah. Well, we celebrate success here and that's a man with purpose we've just heard, so that's awesome to hear. So we can probably almost finish on that unless there's anything else you want to say. No, just thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, nice set up, you guys. Nice to meet you guys as well. Thanks for uh, having me on board. Yeah. I've, I've loved it. It's I'm been so cool. glad you came on. And that was a great chat. And where will people find you? Uh, just look up Inferno Blast, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I'm thinking TikTok soon, gentlemen, but uh, not quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> Got to work on a task first. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Girl running man, you know, never goes miss. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks yeah. for coming over. Thanks for coming on. No worries. It's cool, Cheers, man. man.